is a meeting of the Economic Development Committee. I'm joined here by members of the Common Council, including uh, Councillor Jen Schultz, the First District Councillor, Councillor Michael Green, is a Councillor at Large, Councillor Amir Gathers. I did look and see, I think Councillor Driscoll, Fifth District Councillor, is here. Councillor Latoya Allen, the Fourth District Councillor. Um, so I am going to turn this over. Before we get started, I'm going to I'm going to mention that we'll probably keep this meeting to an hour. This uh, meeting will be to discuss rezone, but I think we're going to, it's going to be the first of a series of meetings. Uh, and I'm now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Carney of the uh, zoning department. Uh, great, um, Councillor Hogan, uh, committee members, uh, we appreciate your time today. Um, we're excited to provide an update uh, and discussion about restarting uh, the rezone Syracuse project. And we're gonna um, we're gonna have a presentation today, which I'll I'm gonna share my screen in just a minute. Uh, but before we do, I just wanted to um, allow some of the the team members here to um, uh, do introductions. Kind of the core team here. I'm just shifting. Is everybody able to to see the um, presentation? Okay, great. Um, so yes, before we get into this, I'd just like a, a couple of people uh, to introduce themselves. Um, and maybe we'll start with the um, planning and zoning team, Dan and Heather, if you'd like to introduce yourselves. Sure, Owen. Uh, I'm Dan Kwasnowski. I'm the planning director of the Syracuse Onondaga County Planning Agency. Hi, I'm Heather Lamondola. I'm the city zoning administrator. And I, I suppose I probably should have introduced myself. I'm Owen Kearney. I, I believe I know most of you. I'm with the city's planning division and have been leading this effort for Rezone Syracuse for um, a few years now. Um, before before I go to the next slide, I also want uh, one uh, our um, legal counsel uh, who is helping us with Seeker. I'd just ask if Matt, you could introduce yourself also. Sure. Hi Owen. Hi everyone. Matt Kerwin. I'm an attorney with Barclay Damon here in town. I think it's your council for for the city on this. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, our our meeting agenda today, um, really a two part presentation. The first, uh, Matt, uh, who just introduced himself, is going to provide an overview of the secret process, the New York State Environmental Quality Review. Uh, that's really the the crux, and that's essentially going to be the the item before you here shortly. Um, relative to the rezone Syracuse project. The second part of uh, the presentation is I am going to provide an update on rezone Syracuse. Again, uh, look at a review of the project goals, our accomplishments to date, our summary of our next steps, and then uh, with the time left um, and, and it, with uh, Councillor Hogan's direction, um, any questions and answers before we wrap up. So. That's our meeting agenda. That's what we hope to accomplish today. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Uh, he's going to provide that secret overview before we get into rezone. Thanks. So, can everybody hear me? Okay. Okay, great. So, I'm just going to give up some brief comments about seeker. I'm sure some of you are familiar with with the statute a little bit from your. Uh, you work with the council, uh, but I wanted to give you just a kind of a, a refresher, a brief refresher at that as to what the, you know. What the law amounts to, why we have to comply with it here, and kind of where we are in the secret process. So, uh, with that, uh, just very briefly, secret was enacted in the 70s essentially to, uh, uh, to reiterate the need for local agencies to see themselves as stewards of the environment uh, to protect our natural resources, air, water, and specifically. And the purpose of the act is to ensure uh, that local agencies and state governmental agencies like yourself uh, take into account and consider environmental factors when uh, entering into planning uh, view and decision making uh, activities. Uh, you know, SEEKER, which stands for the State Environmental Quality Review Act, uh, it's important to note must be completed before any local agency like yourself can undertake, fund, or approve an action. So in this case, we've got the rezone uh, ordinance and map before the common council and for that matter the planning commission can consider acting on whether to adopt that 
uh, you have to complete the secret process. So this is important. It's an important step in the process. It's one we've uh, we've initiated over the last uh, few years to try and get to this point, and we're we're in the middle of it, so to speak. So, and I'll I'll update you on where we are in just a second or two. But you know why why is it necessary to do seeker for the rezone? I think the question comes down to to one simple explanation, and that is this is an action is defined under the under the under the law. You know, the law, as I mentioned, states that all state and local governmental agencies are required to complete a secret review for any action they have the discretion to undertake, fund, or approve. And again, the adoption of rezone and the associated map, zoning map for the city, constitute an action that's subject to secret review. So if the council were to, for whatever reason, um, uh, bypass their secret review in connection with this application, it, 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 procedural defect that could be easily challenged. So we're trying to ensure that all the steps are filed, you know, going forward and that the, uh, that the appropriate mechanisms are in place for the boards to, to take appropriate action at the appropriate time. So, uh, the common council is the lead agency is that it's a quote, it's a term of art under seeker. It's the, essentially the lead agency for the purpose of completing the review as the lead agency you're responsible for undertaking the review working with staff to prepare the necessary forms and essentially go through the, the appropriate evaluations of potential environmental impacts to ensure that whatever action you decide to take uh, is in compliance with the secret law. Uh, again, as the lead agency, uh, you're going to determine whether the adoption of rezone will have a significant adverse impact on the environment or not. Uh, and the steps we've taken to this point are intended to address uh, all of your statutory requirements under the law to ensure that you're, you're in an appropriate position down the road to, to make that determination. Uh, I should point out that while the council is, an involved, is, a, is the lead agency for the review and responsible for undertaking the review and completing it, the planning commission is considered an involved agency. And what that means is the planning commission, if you recall, previously consented to the common council acting as lead agency. So they're essentially waiting for the common council to complete its review before they can undertake the action that will be before them uh, pursuant to the city charter. Uh, any questions on that before I, I kind of jump into where we are in the process? No? Okay. So uh, the process is pretty straightforward. It's laid out in the statute. And where we are right now, well, I'll take you through where we've been. So to start the process, the council had to first classify the action. They were given a copy of the of the, the rezone at the time. Uh, it's, it's been revised slightly since then, but they were provided with a copy of the rezone uh, to initiate the secret process. You declared yourself lead agency for the review, and you ultimately issued, issued what's called a positive declaration uh, with the intent of preparing what's called an environmental impact statement. So, in issuing the positive declaration, you, you determined back then, and some of you were on, on the commission, on the council, some of you weren't. But the council determined back then that uh, there were there were various potential environmental impacts. Do you felt warranted further review and evaluation in the form of an environmental impact statement? And specifically, uh, you decided to pursue uh, the preparation of a generic environmental impact statement, which is appropriate in the sense because the rezone is uh, it's it's uh, essentially a land use ordinance, and the GEIS uh, process is is really designed to accommodate and approach and review of this broad nature. So uh, you're pursuing the right path in terms of the DGS. Uh, so in terms of where we are, uh, you previously completed the scoping process, uh, which is required in this case. And the scoping process essentially was intended to identify those uh, potential environmental impacts that you felt should be addressed more thoroughly in the, in the DG. Uh, it also allowed you to essentially help to create an outline for the environmental impact statement itself. And it gives you the, it gave you the opportunity to eliminate various issues that you deemed insignificant or irrelevant based on your evaluation at that time. Uh, that scoping document has been finalized, and that again forms the outline for the draft generic environmental impact statement, which is currently nearing completion. So in terms of remaining steps in the process, uh, we have a few. We, we have again a draft generic environmental impact statement that's that's in progress. 
near completion, we, I believe Owen's going to touch touch on this more in a few minutes here, but that should be coming your way shortly. From that point, you will need to determine whether that you feel that document is complete for the purposes of opening it up for public review and comment. Once that determination is made, uh, the public would have an opportunity to provide public comment on the document itself, on the generic environmental impact statement. After all, after the public comment period ends, the council will then have to prepare with staff's uh, assistance what's called the final generic environmental impact statement. Uh, there are some timing constraints in terms of um, when that's got to be done and how quickly it's got to be completed, uh, but I have no doubt that we'll, we'll comply with all those requirements. And then once the final generic environmental impact statement is, is completed and adopted by the board, by the council, uh, you would then have to issue what's called a finding statement. And the finding statement essentially wraps up the entire process sets forth the board's determination as to whether or not you feel you've complied with the requirements of seeker and whether or not uh, you know an approval of the rezone would be appropriate or not given given the evaluation that's, that's taking place at that point uh, so that's kind of seeker in a nutshell again we're about a third maybe a half of the way through it right now uh, probably has uh, three to four or five more months to go depending on scheduling and, and some 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 other variables, but happy to entertain any questions at this point. If anybody has any, or I can just uh, hand it off to Owen for, for the next next discussion. I just want to mention that we have uh, Councilor Caldwell and uh, Councilor Majuk uh, joined us, and I, the Deputy Mayor is here too. Uh, any members of the council want to question Mr. Kerwin on this issue? I know this is uh, especially a lot to absorb, especially for the new councilors, but. Uh, doing a seeker for the a whole city has got to be fairly unusual, I imagine. Uh, I I know this zoning process, if I'm not mistaken, the last time we attempted this was back in 1968, correct, Owen? Uh, 67 uh, was generally the last time we, we, we looked at this, yes. And the last the time before that was 1922, so we're taking on a mass sort of an undertaking that hasn't been attempted too much before. I wasn't Correct. around for the 1922 one, the, Mr. I think our, our city auditor was. So, um, so saw, any, if there's no other questions, if there's no other questions, where do you want to well, go from I, here, I, Owen? Thanks, Councillor. I will, I'm going to take over and we're going to get into the, the rezone. Um, if, if anything can make zoning look exciting, it is seeker. Uh, that might be the only thing. So uh, appreciate that, Matt. Great overview. Um, the the needless to say, Matt and and the city law department, uh, particularly uh, Joe Barry and Catherine Conreich, are all working closely to advise us and uh, presumably advise all of you uh, through this relatively um, detailed process that Matt laid out. So that's the seeker update. Uh, as I said, I'm going to shift into. Um, a presentation on rezone and just wanted to start by talking a little bit. I'm looking at my screen over here um, about zoning. I think rezone is a zoning project um, and as defined uh, by the city, it's essentially a, a set of land use regulations, how property owners may use and develop their land. Um, it's divided into districts. Uh, zoning is typical nationwide. It's frankly an international uh, way to control uh, land use and development. Uh, as the councilor referenced, um, we have not updated ours uh, since 1967. And as Heather uh, pointed out earlier to me, uh, it really recodified re at that time. It's almost been longer since we really comprehensively updated it. It's been a long time. Um, <laughs> the pre President Johnson was in office. Thurgood Marshall was um, on, on the Supreme Court, and uh, they introduced the Big, Big Mac. I'm trying to make zoning a little bit more uh, relevant here, but the point being is it's been a long time, um, and we are set to revise and update it comprehensively as part of rezone. That is the, really the gist of it. Uh, of of rezone is a comprehensive revision of the city's zoning ordinance and map. The project goals, um, 
how we set out to, to accomplish this was identified um, really in those project goals. And the bulk of this presentation will walk through essentially how we did that. Um, creating a user-friendly ordinance, updating zoning districts, modernizing land uses, um, thinking about design standards, and streamlining the development review process. So as I said, really the, the rest of this presentation will, will kind of walk through how we accomplish that. Before we do, um, just very briefly, Rezone Syracuse specifically is will include these three items. A new zoning ordinance, which is really where the, the rules and regulations are, the new zoning map, and finally, as Matt just talked about, uh, the associated seeker documents, the, the scoping documents, the GEIS, the finding statement. So these are all three elements that will be coming your way in the coming weeks. And we'll talk a little bit of uh, more about when you're receiving them, uh, but that is essentially what you will be asked to consider in the coming weeks. The timeline, where, where we've, most of you uh, looking at the, at the screen here have been involved, uh, it, whether in your current role, in a former role, as a resident, uh, but just wanted to briefly kind of provide an overview. We've been working on this for some time. That's maybe the takeaway from this slide. Uh, we started really in, the tw in 2016 outlining the project. Uh, we spent much of 2016 and 27, uh, 2017 developing the content, really sort of drafting uh, the different sections, the different chapters. Um, we had three consecutive uh, drafts that were, were prepared. Uh, all, and, and then um, the most recent in December of 2019, that's the one that's been posted on the, on the city's website for some time. And right around that time is when we started the seeker review process. We're before you again now, uh, reintroducing, restarting that process with updated seeker documents uh, and with the zoning ordinance and map. So um, obviously during, during the last year and a half to two years, we paused. Uh, one thing that I think is, has been constant through this process is the public input process. We've had public input the entire time. Uh, and obviously, uh, the pandemic has has put a little bit of a wrinkle in that, uh, but we are obviously restarting that discussion uh, with meetings like this today. As I said, uh, public meetings, which I know many of you have attended, we've had close to 100 public meetings throughout the city. Um, we've had 55, uh, probably close to 60 stakeholder meetings uh, with various interest groups, to, uh, engineers, architects, uh, public health advocates, uh, elected officials, transportation organizations. We've talked to a lot of people uh, as we have developed this. And, and really that input has, you, you saw those three drafts and essentially we're on draft number four. All of those revisions and adjustments to this process, to the ordinance, have largely been based on that public input, public engagement. So I think that's important to remember. It really has been refined over uh, the last few years based on public um, public input, resident input. So um, wanted to mention that before we got into uh, the project goals. And again, this um, the first one and, and a real important one, creating a user-friendly ordinance. Um, zoning is typically not something that is uh, considered terribly easy to, to, to understand or work with. Um, our current uh, 1967 version uh, on the left is was was written um, in a very matter of fact way. There was limited formatting. There was almost no graphics, uh, limited tables. Um, not something that's easy for everybody to use. Obviously, many people on this call are familiar with it and can navigate it. But for property owners, for homeowners. Uh, for people that want to make investments in the city, it's not easy to necessarily open that up and determine what you need to do to get your project from start to finish. And so what one of the big elements of this and a goal was uh, to create an ordinance that's just easy, that you don't necessarily have to be an engineer or an architect um, to, to use, that you can pick it up as a neighborhood uh, property owner, as a resident, and work your way and evaluate what you need to do uh, relative to zoning if you are making an investment in your property. Simplify it, clear layouts, um, using graphics, using table, 
again, this is something that, as you can imagine, has been well received uh, and something we frankly should have done a while ago, but it, it's a big part of this project. Um, keeping on that, that user friendly element, um, a couple new additions in addition to just the, the formatting and things like that, uh, we've added some additional elements of, of the of zoning or to zoning uh, to, to help the public and help applicants. First one being um, a staff report tool. Uh, the, the city produces, uh, evaluates zoning applications and writes staff reports, analyzes basically the applications and identify the merits and the deficiencies and, and does that via a staff report. And that's largely an internal document uh, that, that's now, um, it's our intention to, to use this in a way uh, and to share that with applicants. So the applicants essentially know where they stand, what their application, how does it meet or not meet the various requirements and regulations. Again, improving dialogue with the public, with residents, with applicants. Uh, second item, public notification. You see the sign there. Uh, we notify, we, our, our public hearings and public meetings are on our city website, they're in the newspaper, but we know everybody's not looking at the website and, and reading the newspaper. Um, we have proposed to install signage on site, so people that are walking by the development site, that people are biking, that people live around the corner, can look at a sign on a site, and, and this, as you can see, is... Um, out of Maryland, um, but that has more information on what's being proposed there. You don't necessarily have to be tied into the city website or the city email blast, uh, but the, these signs are either, either in a window of a building, uh, on a vacant site, and they help share information with area residents. So they, one, can be aware of what's being proposed in their neighborhood, but two, and perhaps more, more importantly, offer public comments about it. We support this, we have questions about this, we have concerns about this. Again, trying to get people, uh, neighborhood residents, uh, more involved in the zoning, uh, the public process relative to zoning. Final item, uh, as far as user-friendly, is an administrative manual. While we are simplifying the zoning ordinance, it's still a 250-page document, down from about 350, but nonetheless, it's still a big ordinance, even if it is easier to use and understand. The administrative manual is something that we've developed as kind of a user's guide, something we don't currently have now. All three of these elements are new, and we feel um, not feel, we have heard will be well received uh, by the community, uh, both residents and, and the development community. Those are, again, a couple items on how we are making this uh, a, a more user-friendly uh, document. Updating zoning districts. Um, again, 1967, a lot has changed. Uh, this, while there have been adjustments, um, probably almost every year, the zoning office, Heather and her team, are adjusting and improving the ordinance. It hasn't been done comprehensively. One of the big project goals was to do that. Um, and so we developed a new set of zoning districts, which you see there. Um, some of them real similar to old zoning districts. Again, it was these were built on the existing districts, but we expanded upon them. So we still have residential zoning districts, uh, but we have also implemented um, implemented and developed some new zoning districts that reflect current and future market demands um, in the city. Two of those uh, that, again, I, I think are worth calling out. Um, one, the mixed use districts. Uh, these are districts, largely uh, neighborhood corridors, uh, think Butternut, South Ave, um, West Genesee, Westcott Street, South Salina, Grand Boulevard, Valley Drive primary corridors in our neighborhood where goods and services uh, either are or should be available to the neighborhoods around them. Um, we've created these mixed use districts to allow a greater mix of uses that people can walk to that are easily accessible and that will ho essentially host a range of different uses uh, along these neighborhood business corridors. Again, to provide goods and services to uh, folks adjacent to those districts. The other one is our uh, a new district is an open space district. Um, currently our parks, 
um, our wooded areas, our steep slopes, um, our recreational areas are zoned residentially, uh, which is really not appropriate. That We're not looking for Heath Park or McKinley Park, uh, as the two examples you see there, to be developed residentially. And not that I, I think there's probably any intention to do so, but they're zoned in a way uh, that it, it's a resident, currently a residential zoning district. So we've developed this open space district to preserve, uh, just as the slide says, parks, recreation, and natural areas. Again, common sense improvements uh, to our uh, zoning districts. Uh, next slide, modernized land uses. Um, I'll stop harping on, on the age of the ordinance. Uh, but needless to say, there are a variety of different uses that are um, outdated uh, that are still in the ordinance. We've removed those. Uh, and there's increasingly a range of different new uses uh, that really aren't accommodated um, in, the, in the current zoning district. So what we have done, uh, developed um, a, a whole host uh, of new land uses. Obviously, some of them are the same single family, two family housing, things like that, dormitories. Um, but we've also developed um, a probably a couple dozen new districts based on current needs, current desires, um, and, and trends, nationwide trends that we're seeing. A few of them uh, as examples. And the, the tables there, again, getting back to that ease of use, it's all laid out in a table. It's well organized, it's easy and accessible. Um, some of those new, new uses, and we'll, we'll, the next page, we'll, maybe we'll talk about these in a little bit more, more detail. Um, row homes, top left corner. Um, or while there are row homes in the city, attached homes, however you, town homes, however you want to call, uh, consider them or, or call them, um, they're not really something that is clearly identified as a permitted use currently. Uh, in an effort to increase housing choice, uh, housing affordability, communities nationwide allow row homes. This is something, again, a new use in the district that we that we feel is relevant and, and a good addition. Um, neighborhood coffee shop, uh, recess coffee uh, over on, what street is that? Oh, that's in the second council district, by the way. Um, that, and it's a thank nice you. on your part. In, in well, that, this as isn't as the Germans. This isn't my first presentation, Councilor yeah, Hogan. Very good. I, I know where to pick my photos from. Um, things like that. Obviously, currently, many of those food-related uses are just considered a restaurant, a bar, things like that. And there's a pretty robust review. And I think we'd all agree something like a coffee shop is a pretty complimentary addition to many neighborhoods. It's not a bar. It's not something that's necessarily going to meet a whole lot of opposition. Let's create some new uses to make it easier for uses like this to be developed in and along our business districts. Um, accessory dwelling units in the bottom right. Uh, this is very topical. I know at the state level, there's some state legislation being considered to allow these additional, the development and construction of these additional units. Uh, we have proposed to allow them in all of our residential and mixed use districts. Uh, again, creating another housing choice and, and improving housing affordability. I mean, when you look nationally at, hey, help, how to help create affordable housing, more choices, more options, um, a range of sizes, things like row homes, town homes, accessory dwelling units are a start to doing that. We've added that to rezone. Finally, I, I saw um, but the budget director on the uh, call earlier. We are uh, have proposed to allow hens. Uh, we know that they exist in the city. Um, what we are doing is creating some rules and regulations. If you are going to do it, uh, there are some standards now on how you do that, where you keep them, and how you operate that. So, again, some of these things uh, a long time coming, but again, thinking um, about how we create housing options, how we provide a range of new and attractive uses to folks. Uh, introducing could you, uniform. Or could I just interrupt a little bit here? Sure. Just, uh, um, I, I know you had a lot of neighbor uh, meetings, a lot of open meetings, and all that. I'm just wondering what what were the numbers as far as how many people actually attended all that those? Do you? Um, some of those meetings were four or five people. 
Um, we had some meetings that were 40 to 50 people um, okay. that we, we held. Um, the TNT predicated on what neighborhoods they were in, at, in they, I imagine. They were in, and also the type of meetings. Some of our, um, some of the meetings that we scheduled uh, were, were lighter attended, but then you go to a, a TNT meeting um, and, and you get 25, 35 people. Uh, so it really ranged from probably five to about 50, I think would be a, a realistic range. Um, but considering 100 meetings, I mean, we, we've, we've reached between our email list, um, our public meetings, uh, we're, we, we've reached over 1,000 people, probably thousands of people in our community about this project. Okay, I didn't mean to interrupt it up. Uh, interrupt you, but I wanted to get that out there. And I also know President Hudson's uh, on the uh, on this call too. So go on, Owen, if you could. We'll we'll do. Um, the fourth and uh, fourth goal, fourth out of five, uh, design standards, building and site design standards. This really gets at the crux of of zoning. Um, we currently have some design standards in uh, along James Street, as some of you are familiar, uh, in the lakefront area. But we really don't have citywide building and site design standards. Some communities have extremely detailed uh, regulations about how the building color, building materials. We have taken sort of a, a middle of the road approach. Uh, things like the front door of the building should face the street. You know, things that are fairly logical. Um, residential buildings need a certain amount of transparency and windows. Uh, certain uh, uh, building materials or shouldn't be used uh, something like a concrete block for uh, a new residential building. We've taken a light approach, but one that we feel is a good start uh, to help improve aesthetics, um, help improve uh, decision making, uh, help improve expectations as far as investments uh, in the city and, and the design of those. Thinking about and, and again on the right there a few of those standards and, and the next two slides will will talk through these uh, landscaping increasing those um, thinking about how landscaping can help improve the aesthetics of a site how it can help improve safety how it can cut down uh, help define uh, commercial areas from residential areas um, thinking about signage standards we have a lot of signage I think we all can probably close our eyes and think of a store or a place in the city that's just overwhelmed with signage, tightening up those signage regulations. Um, development compatibility. I mentioned those, those mixed use corridors, South Ave, uh, Seneca Turnpike, uh, James Street, Westcott, you know, we're all around the city. Each one of those districts, the property directly behind it is almost in always a residential property. People live behind our business corridors. Where these things to meet are, are, are really the, the goal of zoning. How do you ameliorate? How do you minimize the, the conflict between these different uses? Design standards are a great way to do that. So the, the development compatibility standards you see there on the bottom right are just that. How is new development on James Street and the property behind it, how do the where do where those come together? How do you do that in a way where the lights aren't shine the, the lights aren't shining in the window? Uh, the uh, the parking is not encroaching into the residential areas. Um, the the uh, outdoor operation isn't bothering neighbors. All of these things are done via um, zoning uh, design standards. Um, uh, one a couple additional items uh, parking. We have robust and very generous part on site parking requirements. If you're building a building, you need this much parking on site. There's a variety of reasons why that and nationally people have either been reducing or removing their parking requirements. Um, had a lot of conversations with Councillor Green about this over the years. Uh, we have removed or reduced our parking requirements on-site parking requirements citywide. Um, obviously, that provides not only the aesthetic benefits, but things like stormwater uh, and a reduction to project cost. Parking is an expensive uh, proposition, and the development community has been very supportive of uh, reduction in parking requirements. Bike infrastructure, we, you know, we have places for, for pedestrians and places for cars. 
Uh, but increasingly, we know people are using uh, bikes for commuting, for traveling, uh, and we have very few requirements. I don't think we have any re current requirements in the ordinance. So we've developed that as part of these de uh, des design standards. And finally, um, building design, the actual structure. I started talking about this earlier. Building placement and massing, the size of the building, transparency in and out of the building, um, mix of uses for larger site. These are some very basic design standards that will raise expectation for new development in the city uh, and something that all of these standards have been um, fairly well received by the development community, by the design community as we've, we've briefed them. Um, here's a good example uh, that, and I don't see them on the call, but uh, I've, I've received this, this photo from a, a neighborhood advocate um, who had pointed out that just the, the status of it, and this is actually one of perhaps dozens of photos I've uh, received from this neighborhood advocate, but here's a, a, an example of how these new design standards could potentially work. Um, reducing sign clutter, providing transparency into the store, um, including landscaping, which is really non-existent, bike facilities, uh, improve exterior lighting, and again, the, the loose trash cans and dumpsters in the back uh, that you can just barely see there or adjacent to somebody's property. They should be screened, they should be enclosed so the neighbors don't have to look uh, at the trash. So here's here are a couple examples of how we could potentially improve and tighten up um, development and, and investment in the city with these new standards. Um, final project goal, streamline the development review process. This is something obviously um, we have a robust review process now. We looked at how we can um, improve the clarity of that process. Uh, what are important procedural steps? How do we communicate that with applicants to improve predictability? They have a sense of where they're going, where they start, and where they end and how long it's gonna take. Uh, we've done that obviously through the use of graphics, uh, tables, things like that. We've also sort of right size review. Minor projects get a minor, a more minor review typically. Larger projects get a more robust review. There's not a sort of one size fits all process um, and, and help, you know, smaller things can be done uh, quicker and more efficiently. Larger things that, that weren't a larger review get that. Uh, specifics like uh, new fees and submittal requirements will be included that in that administrative manual. And finally, having a little bit, building in some flexibility, uh, the zoning administration office, um, not often, but there are times where, you know, they're a foot off here, they're six inches off there, having some of these minor setback, building height, things like that, rather than have to go back to a review process, having some flexibility built in where, um, the zoning administrator, Heather and her team are able to do that administratively. Again, thinking about um, user experience, thinking about simplifying things. Uh, these are some procedures we developed uh, to do that. Um, a new procedure uh, that we've talked about, and this, is, this has been in all of the drafts, but the, the site plan review procedures. Again, uh, some of you may be familiar with the project site review process, which is unique to Syracuse. We essentially developed that uh, a, a, about 20 or 30 years ago. Site plan review is a, a state process, and we are essentially kind of bringing our um, bring ourselves into compliance with the, that sort of site plan uh, review process, which is well established, used by all the adjacent communities in Onondaga County. Um, and that one of the elements of that is the sketch plan review, working with applicants early in the process so they can come in, talk to staff, even talk to the planning commission and others early before they make the investment uh, in all of the final plans and, and final engineer drawings um, that they can have that sort of first pass, get a sense of where they are and, and refine it based on those early discussions. So again, thinking about user experience, thinking about predictability um, and ease of use. Um, post seeker, uh, as we, these are all of those elements I just talked about have been part of the project really since the inception. A just talking through a couple elements uh, since we held that scoping session, which again, scoping is part of the seeker review process. Uh, we started that, pro we held the public hearing on January 7th, 
of 2020. And the final scoping document was adopted in March of 2020, which as you all recall, March is really when things kind of um, froze. Uh, we stopped that process. Some of the things that we heard during uh, the secret process, probably first and foremost was housing. You are not doing enough with housing. We heard that from public, from the public. We've heard that from housing advocates. And we heard that uh, and we worked with uh, counselors to refine what we're doing with housing. Uh, specifically, uh, Council President Hudson, uh, Councilor Allen, uh, former Councilor Bay, all had made it very clear that we need to develop some affordable housing uh, rules and regulations. And that's exactly what we have done uh, since that scoping process started. We've worked very closely with those counselors, uh, briefed, um, I believe, just about all the other counselors, and worked very closely with uh, Commissioner Collins, uh, Michelle and others in NBD to continue to refine that. Um, and what you have is a series of both um, incentives, uh, requirements, uh, and some new policies that will help uh, facilitate the development of affordable housing um, in the city of Syracuse. Um, first one being, and, and I'll go over these, I know we could, this could probably warrant a whole meeting unto itself, but a requirement, this perhaps is the first and foremost, and, and we, this is unique to large upstate cities. We are really at the forefront of this, and I think that is worth noting. We've done some research on that uh, recently. All new development and redevelopment, so whether that's a new building or the redevelopment of an old building, uh, greater than 19 units, basically larger format uh, buildings must set aside 10% uh, of those units for um, uh, affordable uh, that they would be identified. And that is as part of that redevelopment and development process. That is not you build the affordable units somewhere else or in a different neighborhood, but that, that those projects are included. Uh, and and we, we've started to discuss that as part of zoning as, as mixed income development, that you have market rate and affordable in the same development. Um, that is new since the scoping. Uh, we've, again, I talked briefly about housing choice, the accessory dwelling units, uh, the row homes, both of those have been uh, expanded uh, as housing choice options. And we've also created um, some incentives in uh, low density residential areas that you may add an additional unit or two if that is identified as an affordable unit. Uh, so these are things that we heard uh, again, and work with those counselors. Um, we've heard from housing advocates and, and the public, and we actually uh, had a, one of the things that we did, um, as you can imagine, there was, there was broad support from housing advocates, from those counselors I mentioned, uh, but even in the development community, we, we had meetings with about a half dozen developers who all said, absolutely, you need, the city has uh, a quality affordable housing issue, you need to start thinking about this. We need to start thinking about that. And that's exactly what uh, we did. The site plan review process is something that, again, I, I, I mentioned that earlier. We've revised that to include the sketch plan, which is that early informal review with staff and, and potentially with the, the reviewing boards. And we've also made some edits for clarity along the way. The last, uh, the last topic here is the zoning map, and I'll move through this fairly quickly. Um, we talked about the ordinance. The other part of that is the zoning map. Uh, we have developed a final draft of the map, and what the, what the map does, we have those new zoning districts, residential, mixed use, industrial, open space. We've applied all of those uh, new zoning districts to the city's parcel map. Uh, the city has over 41,000 parcels. I think it's close to about 41,200. Uh, zoning has been applied to all of them. Um, and, th and again, we, we've had, I think this is version uh, map number five that we're, we're currently on, the first one being developed a few years ago. Since that first version, we've made changes to about 5,000, a little bit over 5,000 parcels. And that has largely been driven by um, property owner, neighborhood input, stakeholder input, and just research, refining that as we go, um, looking at um, 
again, in, in some of the things you see on here, prominently downtown being a mixed use district, portions of Erie Boulevard, this is the Northeast quadrant. Uh, green is the new open space districts for our parks and cemeteries, things like that. Um, re the rezone map is really where we've captured all of those new zoning districts. Long-term implementation, basically as we move through this process, um, what what happens after that? We understand that the that this document is is a living document. It's one that needs to not wait another uh, 55 years to be updated. Uh, we have established metrics to track the performance. We talked about those administrative adjustments. Are we using them too much? Should we change something? Parking regulations. Do we need to do more? Uh, the thresholds for minor and major reviews. Is that off balance or things that we're considering minor administrative reviews, but the public wants to see them? Should they be major reviews? Tightening that up, um, our plan and, and SIDA is actually uh, the Industrial Development Agency has set aside some money uh, so that we can work with our consultant, Clarion, um, who, who really helped us develop this, um, to come back in a year, year and a half and revisit this with us. So I, I think it's important to note that, you know, the adoption of this, which, you know, there'll be a lot of meetings, there'll be a lot of discussion. This is not the last time we're gonna touch this document. It's something that we understand that the day it's adopted, there are things that we're gonna have to start reviewing and evaluating. And we've built in metrics to do that. We've set aside dollars to do that. And we've got some experts to help us make those changes, let's say a year out. Um, and, and, and that that final bullet, I think, really kind of captures the, the essence of what we're trying to do. Evaluate the effectiveness of this new ordinance in creating desirable places in our community, in our neighborhoods, on our business corridors, in and around our parks, in and around our schools, and thinking about how um, transit-oriented development, considering all the transportation changes that will be occurring over the next five to 10 years, how does zoning react to them? How do we need to update zoning uh, based on those? So finally, uh, last slide here, uh, status and next steps. Uh, it, it is February. Uh, we're holding obviously this informal, uh, or this committee meeting, I should say. It's our intention to deliver those three items, the ordinance, the map, and the, uh, the secret documents to you uh, in the near future prior to us um, introducing legislation to you uh, later this month uh, to begin consider restarting that secret process as Matt talked about. Um, we anticipate, as, as Matt mentioned, that, that, uh, that March will really, um, will be a, you know, there will be public hearings, there will be public comment periods. Uh, we anticipate that to be about a three or four month uh, process, that state review process. Uh, and then uh, this summer, we expect uh, the completion of that and, and the um, review and consideration and adoption of the new zoning ordinance and map. So um, with that covered a lot of ground, uh, covered multiple years of work, couple, uh, covered uh, 100 plus public meetings. Uh, we have a great ordinance. Uh, we've made some huge improvements, some much needed improvements that will affect quality of life, that will affect safety, that will affect housing, uh, we're excited to talk uh, with you about them and um, happy to, you know, I'll, I'll defer to the uh, Councillor Hogan about our, our next steps here. Um, thank you, Owen. That was uh, very long and very concise, though. God bless you. Um, we got a lot to cover and I can see, you know, it's only the third time in the city's history we've taken on something like this. So this is pretty serious. And I was wondering if uh, any of my colleagues on the council have any questions. Yeah, I do, I do, Councillor Hogan, if I could go. Sure, go ahead, Councillor Driscoll. Yeah, I was just curious, uh, Owen, if the um, if the um, the affordable requirements, do those apply to all types of development? Is that, you know, would that a, a, a apply to, would there be any exemptions, you know, historical or, or for university type projects? What, what type of, uh, would, would that just be flat across the board or would there be some exceptions along the way? Yeah, uh, Councillor, good good question. Um, this a couple things. The requirements are citywide. It's not in one neighborhood or one area. 
Uh, it's not, it doesn't uh, differentiate between uh, what we commonly consider student housing. Uh, it is for all projects citywide. So I think that is an important requirement and important distinction. Uh, we're working with um, uh, Commissioner Collins and his team uh, to the, the historic is, is an important distinction. Is there uh, some type of hardship where you're renovating an existing building that has three units? Um, adding another unit to a historic building may not be an option. So one of the things that we have considered is uh, the development of a housing trust uh, where the developer could pay into that and that the city would be able to use that and set aside those dollars to facilitate affordable housing uh, elsewhere. And I'll, I'll, if, if that's something you, obviously we can follow up on more details. I don't know if Michael, you have anything to add to that, but um, there are those sort of physical hardship sort of um, things that we're considering. If you just physically are redeveloping a building that can't be added to uh, that we would allow uh, and work with the development community in those instances. But our intention is that is that include the affordable housing in the new development, not build it elsewhere, not give pay the city, but to build the units. Our goal is to to to, to create affordable housing units. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Councilor Michael Collins, Commissioner of Neighborhood and Business Development, uh, uh, Councilor District, uh, or Driscoll, it's a, it's a great question. To build on what what Owen is is saying here, when you look at the the fact that uh, we're not talking you know micro development, so so we're talking greater than 19 units. Uh, uh, historic actually is an interesting uh, example because that, uh, due to the the tax credits that are available there, that actually does sometimes add to the capacity to to create affordable housing because you're, you've got access to funding that you wouldn't have access to otherwise. So what we're trying to do is find that balance that recognizes uh, the need all the way through this community to uh, have more affordable housing with, um, you know, understanding what the costs of such development actually actually are. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we have heard from constituents uh, and, and from counselors, um, you know, that, that this, this is a great need. And so this is a time for us to be able to to recognize uh, how, how we can address that going forward. I have a question if I could um, get clarification on Owen, you mentioned that the parks are gonna be rezoned to open space districts to provide some more preservation. Is that literally every single park as we know it now or are there exclusions in there? No, no, our, um, it is all city parks uh, would get that open space designation. So um, I think that's important to note that that doesn't mean that you can't build a field house or a pool or a playground. It's not, hey, th this is an area that can therefore never be changed. Uh, if they want to develop an outbuilding in Kirk Park, it would allow that. Uh, if you want to um, expand the, the, um, the area in Berry Park, that's acceptable. The idea is that we are acknowledging uh, that these parks are special places, they're community places, and they're not areas for large scale development. They have to remain public uh, and publicly accessible. So again, that's something that I think we all on this call, as we know, parks are a special place. We just had a big discussion about that, but this is something that kind of bringing our zoning um, up up to speed with the value that we place on our park. So I think important to note that that doesn't mean you can't do anything in parks moving forward. It just sets some limits on other types of development. Great. One more question too. Um, you said you're removing the parking requirement in, in some of that. So is the thought obviously to create more green space, not require, you know, so much pavement behind a house or a, an apartment building? And then is there adequate street parking to accommodate that rezone? So we have um, the, the parking large, it, the parking is a, a complicated um, endeavor. Um, it's largely based on use. And we have in many uses have uh, reduced it. Uh, there are some instances where we have removed it altogether. Um, our goal, our goal is, is that that frequently parking can be a burden uh, for 
property owners and developers to provide. They don't necessarily need it. Now, I think we all know uh, that there is frequently having on site parking um, is uh, a good thing. Uh, and I, I think I had some slides in there where you, you need to do it, but we are increasingly allowing uh, people to rely on on street parking. Uh, and other options, community parking lots uh, to provide parking. So it's increasing options, it's reducing requirements, uh, but it's not uh, across the board. There are no parking regulations. Some communities have done that. Uh, we didn't go quite that far, but we've made some pretty significant reductions. So Owen, on the parking, how would this um, affect uh, like some of my constituents up in the university neighborhood? I've sat on a few of the planning meetings where people was trying to get a driveway in, and that was like a real fight when they would they couldn't get the driveway into their home. And then you have a few of them, um, few of like the landlords had the parking in the back for the students, and that always is an issue. So what's the remedy for that? Uh, 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 and and the only thing that can be more complicated than parking is university area parking, counselor, as you well know. Um, we have a couple different things. Uh, parking is uh, we have created parking maximums, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm looking to my my colleagues here. If uh, anything to add, Heather and Dan regarding single family, two family housing uh, uh, parking up in that area, um, we've put some limits. I think one of the big things up there it's a balance between does the entire park uh, backyard. Uh, get turned into a parking lot, which I think uh, many people living in those places like that option, uh, but many adjacent property owners uh, don't because they typically turn into one huge parking lot. Uh, there's no landscaping, uh, there's stormwater issues. Uh, we beefed up our parking regulations to help address that, uh, but we have not necessarily discontinued parking altogether up there. Great questions. Uh... Both Councilor Schultz and Alan uh, kind of point to an issue where, you know, kind of turning the switch off on off street parking um, requires some other uh, programs, right? So, currently in the University of Neighborhood, I know uh, SMTC, the area MPO, is doing a resident permit study. And one of the reasons that that's important is that if you're going to have a lot of on street parking, uh, the city should really capture some revenue from that, but maybe not for the people that actually live there, uh, but maybe for the people that are. Parking there to go to a game or go to work, um, and then the other important thing, uh, even downtown, is is to make sure you capture revenue at times when it's, uh, you know, more valuable um, based on location. So those are all systems that we can actually, you know, the city can put those in place, but it's going to take some time. And kind of to Owen's point, that's why we couldn't just turn off off street parking. With the parking behind apartment buildings, and Heather can kind of speak to what we currently have and what. The biggest challenge now is we have the regs. Um, the city has regs on limits of impervious surface, um, and the most stringent efforts to enforce that have not really succeeded. Um, and so, a lot of it's you know, a lot of this is an, an enforcement issue as well. So, and all communities struggle with enforcement issues, um, especially cities. Um, it, so that, but that doesn't mean that you don't put the proper policy in place and what we're trying to do is create a framework um, and a structure within zoning and within the limits of zoning you can't do everything in zoning right um, but then to work together to identify well what else do we need to do to really make this work whether it's enforcement or resident permit programs um, or capturing revenue from on street parking uh, to pay for your, your street maintenance um, so as you know, as you all know, because uh, you've been on the council for a while, or even if you're new, you've been, been in the city for a while, you know, these things are all uh, intertwined and uh, related to each other. Um, so this is, you know, zoning is one piece and is often one piece of the puzzle, um, but you, you, you know, we've got to figure out what the other pieces are and make sure it all works together um, outside of zoning too. So Councilor Allen, it's Heather. Um, so I guess what I can say overall, not just about parking and not just about university area parking is we can change anything that we want, but if it's not enforced, that is the biggest piece. Owen showed some slides of signs talking about us updating our signage regulations. Those signs that he showed are not allowed now. So without enforcement, even the best regulations are, are 
are not going to be, you know, we can change everything, but we need good enforcement. But with respect to parking, we do have limits now, percentages in certain zoning districts. Um, we also have screening requirements now. We are keeping those, not letting up on those. Uh, so if, if that if that helps at all, but enforcement is a huge piece to everything in this ordinance, especially because we have changed some things and added some things that I, I will, you know, bring us to uh, good design and, and good quality of life. So could I ask, I'm just wondering, our neighborhoods are so unique. Is there a petitioning process? Is there something where we, we put this into into effect? All these this new rezone, and we find out something doesn't work, or something uh, that we haven't uh, that we haven't thought about in the future happens. I, I remember particularly, and I was going to call on um, Heather. Um, we had a an issue uh, that was uh, had nothing to do with anything, but side uh, handicap ramps became an issue because they covered up a certain amount of property and they technically weren't allowed. And we went back and forth on that. So is there going to be, and I'm, I'm thinking it's particularly not only about parking, but this accessory housing, uh, which has run into, you know, it's sort of common out West, but it's running a lot of problems out West, especially specifically in Los Angeles. Um, are, are, we're talking about like changing structures that aren't housing structures normally into housing, correct? Is that what you're talking about, Owen? No, well, doing the, out the, west? The, the structures, uh, the idea that you're, con th this would have to be, these are living spaces. So the idea that you just kind of turn your garage into uh, a dwelling unit, it would have to be up to code. Uh, so the idea that people But that's are exactly just, what they're doing out west. Right, and this is something that there's, there are some pretty uh, rigorous design regulations if you're going to create these, um, they first and foremost, uh, they they I, the one of the regulations are they must be owner um, owner occupied. So it isn't something. The idea that everybody up in the university area is just going to convert the garage to a, a second unit, um, we've put some some uh, the ability to prevent that along with some design standards about how you do that. In many instances, they are connected to the house. Um, regarding ramps, we have, this is something and, and the, um, we've met with, uh, mobility advocates that brought up that very issue. Uh, we've built in, uh, greater allowance for things like, uh, ramps, frankly, that are, can be just reviewed administratively. So. We have made some of those longstanding issues um, improvements, and uh, the accessory dwelling units is a good example. We don't have them now, so I'm by no means going to say uh, that that's a, a, a is is not going to be without issues. But I do think uh, between the design standards, our ability to revisit this, um, I do think considering uh, the housing issues we have, I do think it's something worth considering. But that's obviously the the council's prerogative about how we move forward with that. So, Owen, there will be like, the, will there be a process to be are you saying this is a living document? Will there be a process to amend this if we need to? And yes. how would we do about how would we do that? The council say, I'm, I'm particularly thinking just the councilor Allen's point parking in you know, some of our neighborhoods are very unique. I, I live up on Tipperary Hill. In fact, when I was on this meeting, the guy across the street called me up to so he could park his other car in my garage in my uh, small little driveway. So, I mean. If something's built down the street for me, which is being considered yeah. uh, a housing complex yeah. uh, that might not get approved for all the parking, all those extra cars are going to end up on the street. Right. And that you know, already and buy for spaces that other people are already have to fighting buy. for. Yeah, right. Exactly. So I, I think the larger issue of is how do we fix issues that present themselves? Um, I, I would suggest exactly. that, that we, um, many of the issues that we are currently dealing with, we've improved. Now, in doing that, you may create, as we all know, you, you change something and you create a whole new set of issues. 
I think what we have is a document that will be updated, that will be easier to work with, and that we're committed to coming back to you and working with you, as I said. And not only that, we've sort of put our money where our mouth is. We have funds dedicated to do that and at, at you know, year one or 18 months, or for that matter, if something comes up and nine months later, we have to do it. Um, I think I can speak on behalf of the project team and the administration that we're ready uh, to revisit that with you, uh, to, to discuss those issues with you. Um, a good example of that, uh, the Neighborhood and Business Development Office is preparing for their housing assessment. Um, that's going to be a wealth of information. We may be able to develop some additional uh, affordable housing policies based on that or refines the, refine the ones we have. So we're ready to, uh, with, with neighborhood concerns, with district issues, uh, with new data that presents itself, um, we're ready to, to revisit that with you. And I think we'll be, have a document that's a little easier to, to, to make those updates on. So um, that, that isn't, uh, that's not necessarily going to mean we're, at, we're without any issues, but that's a commitment to say we're ready to work with you to resolve them. All right. I, I think I'll, I'll you have. Oh, sorry. Who else is? Uh, Dan? Yeah, this is Dan. I'm sorry. I just want to point out that the parking changes, they're not, they do not prohibit somebody from having off street parking. They only lower the requirement. If a developer says, hey, I really need, you know, this much parking, it's up to the planning commission to work with the neighborhood and to figure out what the appropriate number is. If there's already an existing issue, that should come up during site plan review. Okay. okay so, so it's, it's so it's something he'll have to deal with. The 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 uh zoning requirement would be less than he might need, and then he'd have to go to the planning commission to get it expanded. Maybe because we have maximums now. We do have some maximums, but oh so it might not so work out possible. for the neighborhood as much as exactly right. Okay. So the right. neighborhood would be calling well, Heather. I, I, I think the important thing to note is that we are trying to build in greater neighborhood involvement and dialogue um, and setting up a process to do that. And also the, the site plan review process. Um, part of the, the, the element there is that early sketch plan review that you are able to meet with uh, the, the zoning office, the planning commission and others in a public setting where these issues can be vetted early. And so you're right, there are some of those uses that may only need a half dozen parking spots, but there may be some that need all 25 parking spots. They have 25 units, they want them, they need them. Uh, that is not something that we are going to prohibit, uh, but we are we are putting a cap on it. So to go beyond that, it's something that they would need to work with the planning commission uh, to, to accomplish. Oh, and I have a question for now, now, what's what's the strategy around commercial properties that are closely adjacent to to residential? The strategy there, and I think I'm I'm sort of inferring here the idea that you have commercial non-residential properties or commercial properties that abut or are next to residential. And I think there, Councillor South Avenue, uh, over on Glenwood, uh, all over uh, that area, really in every council district, we have examples of that situation. What we're talking about is not that those things cannot continue to operate, but as they are updated, as they are redeveloped, they must come into compliance with the new standards, meaning that if they have lighting that's shining into their neighbor's um, second story windows, if they have parking that's encroaching on their neighbor's property, if they have signage that's um, not uh, uh, consistent with the new regulations, that must be brought into compliance in an effort to do two things. One, comply with the zoning ordinance, but two, reduce the adverse or the potential adverse impacts on those neighborhood resident, those neighboring residential properties. So. There are, as Heather noted, some of that is already in place. We're beefing that up. Uh, landscaping, signage, lighting, these are all things that begin to, to um, these are big issues where commercial and residential come together. We have a lot of instances that in the city and we've developed design standards to help mitigate those issues. Yeah, I'm asking that, 
<clears throat> Owen, because in my district, there are a couple of properties that are car shops, you know, commercial car shop uh, places that are so, so close to residential area. Very, mm -hmm. that, that's like barely no distance at all. Mm -hmm. And 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 I'm asking that. I mean, this is nothing of your uh, of your doing, mm -hmm. but I, but it's 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 the way prior zoning laws were designed, right? Yeah. And I'm asking moving forward, you know, as as there have been consideration in something like that because this this business is next to so close next to residential can be nuisance, yeah. you know, and especially especially if the play if the places contain people with 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 disabilities and and children you know it, it can it can be it can be a, a neighborhood problem yeah yeah well, and, counselor, and that, keep in keep in mind the comment i made about enforcement that could be totally illegal right now it could have been had to have been screened had to have a buffer but never was installed and for some reason or not enforcement hasn't caught up with them or it has and they just haven't done what they needed to do so that that piece is so so important and so if you're going to when you look at this uh, um and this also gets back to Councilor hogan's point you know when we send you the law and you look at it identify those things that you know you want to talk about further before you're voting on this so that we can say maybe you don't like the fact that we took out all these parking regulations that I think that you will, but um, but hopefully the second piece of that, when it is passed, we will likely see issues, the more applications that come in. So if we see all of these things coming in, we say, you know what, there just there's too many of this. Maybe, maybe this isn't appropriate here. I it would it'd be incumbent upon us a to tell you that. So we could come back to you and say, listen, this just isn't working. Can we change this part of the ordinance? Likewise, as you hear from constituents or see these things happening yourselves, you come to us and say, you know, we really want to change this piece. We we just don't think it's it's really working here. So there, I, I'm hoping that that will happen. That we're not just going to sit here and say, yep, this is it, and we're never going to change it again because it's that's not why we did it. I mean, I, I hope moving forward that we can make it the best piece of legislation it can possibly be to help everyone. Okay, uh, I'm 15 minutes over what I said. Um, is there anybody who's got a desperate question to ask Owen or Heather or Dan here? Because we're gonna have other, <laughs> Councilor Schultz, I caught you. Um, if, um, because I'm gonna have, a, we're gonna have other meetings. Uh, Oh, and so what is on the our, our city of Syracuse website regarding zoning is the latest draft, correct? No, no. And, and just very briefly, maybe some some parting uh, thoughts. I appreciate that, Councillor Schultz. Um, we are going to deliver you uh, the updated doc, you the Common Council, the updated documents um, it, it, it within the coming week. Uh, that's the new ordinance, uh, the new map. Uh, and the seeker documents. Uh, that is in preparation of a formal ordinance request that will come your way later this month. So essentially before uh, that legislation um, is before you, you will have these documents um, in advance of that and uh, for your review. At that point, obviously we will post everything on the city website. Uh, for public review, and as we go into that public comment period, people will have these documents at their fingertips. Um, so I think it's important to note, you don't have this today. You're going to have this these new documents in the near future. This was the first of many conversations about it. We wanted to kind of get it on your radar. We think there's a lot of great improvements uh, in rezone, and as as Dan and and Heather and I mentioned, uh, if you have a, a follow up email, reach out. If you're looking for a one on one conversation about housing, about parking, about anything, let us know. We're ready, willing, and able to 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 hold that. And counselor, if you think it warrants another committee meeting about a specific issue, happy to be there too. So we we are going to be getting you some documents. We're going to be requesting to be on your agenda uh, within the next 30 days, and that will all essentially really formally restart uh, this process. 
Well, I'm going to talk to members of my committee uh, and the, my other colleagues on the council. Uh, I appreciate all your efforts, everybody in the city, every uh, Owen, Heather, Dan, everybody, Mike, everybody's uh, done this work. Um, you know, we'll have to like, uh, you know, I, and I appreciate your offer of, uh, of uh, any kind of counseling that you want to, that we do. Yeah. I imagine you'll get some more than a few phone calls from my colleagues. So sure. uh, with that being said, I will wish everybody a good afternoon. Um, elderly people like uh, the city auditor should watch how he shovels tomorrow. And because we don't want to lose you there, Nader. <laughs> Uh, so I will, uh, I'll call this meeting to an end and we'll probably have another meeting, I imagine. Thank you, Owen. Thank Sounds you, everybody. Good. Thanks, Counselor.